Hello, and welcome to Still Behind the Bench. My name is Adam, and on this channel, I will attempt to describe the science behind distilling spirits in a more technical way. Hopefully, it'll whet your appetite to learn more and teach you enough so that you're more self-sufficient. So for this video, I'm going to talk about AC power. Let's get started. I'm a big proponent of using electricity to heat mashes and washes, and to distill. I've never used other methods like propane or natural gas, so I can't really speak for them. Using electricity is a very efficient way to heat liquids, especially if you're using something like an induction cooktop or an immersion heater, where the heated surface of the element is in direct contact with the liquid being heated. You can easily hit 90% efficiency with induction or immersion. With something like gas, you'd be lucky to hit 50%. So I can really only see two real reasons to use electricity. And that is if the price of electricity is significantly higher than gas, or you do not have access to a high power circuit and it would be cost prohibitive for you to install one, or you have no ability to install one because you rent or lease the property. So all around the world, homes will have somewhere between 200 volts and 250 volts AC RMS into their home. It will be at a frequency of 50 or 60 Hertz in places like Africa, Australia, New Zealand, most of Asia, the buck stops there. That 240 volts is then distributed throughout the house. But in most of North America, South America, Japan, and other areas dotted throughout the world, they also use what is called split phase, where that initial AC power is split into two lower voltage circuits that are in phase with each other out at the transformer in front of the house. And in the case of Canada and the US, each circuit is at 120 volts AC RMS. You'll notice I say RMS a lot. That is the value being used when speaking about house voltages. Even when talking to an electrician, they will be talking about the RMS value. There are in fact four different voltage values when speaking about AC. You have peak, peak to peak, RMS, and average. We are only concerned with RMS though. Originally, RMS was calculated by taking the wave breaking it up into equal divisions and measuring the voltage at each division. Then you would square each of those values. You would take the mean of all those squared values and then you would square root them. And that would give you your RMS value. Why do we use RMS? Because it is the DC power equivalent of that AC waveform. So 240 volts AC RMS passed through a 100 ohm resistor would generate the same amount of heat as passing 240 volts DC through that same resistor. Today though, we can just look it up, measure it, or if we know peak to the peak value, peak to peak, or average values, we can calculate it. AC RMS is peak times 0.707, or peak to peak divided by 1.414, or average times 1.11. Although I doubt you will be dealing with those other values that much unless you build your own control circuitry. So before I go into showing you how to determine how much power you need, I'd like to take a quick moment to talk about some fundamentals that I've seen improperly described on other channels. I will start with split phase power, then I'll talk about power level adjustment, how that power is actually being used, and two common formulas you should know to be able to calculate electricity related values. So now let's talk about split phase power. For those of you that don't live in a region that uses split phase, you can jump to the next section of the video unless you are curious, then keep watching. There are numerous videos out there that claim split phase is two phases of electricity. That is 100% wrong. It is only a single phase. It just looks like it's two phases. If someone tells you that split phase is two phases, they don't know what they're talking about. Split phase is created out at the transformer in front of your home. Somewhere on your street, that transformer will receive something like 2.4 kilovolts as its input to the primary coil of the transformer. And then the output voltage on the secondary coil of that transformer will be 200 volts. This is a power transformer with a 10 to one ratio. So for every 10 volts on the primary, you get one volt on the secondary, the output. At the same time, the current is increasing by 10 times, so that the amount of power flowing through each side of the transformer is the same. With split phase, the difference then becomes that there's also what is called a center tap, the neutral, which is earth grounded out at the transformer. It is placed in the center of the secondary coil. 
So then the potential between that neutral and one of the live lines is half of what the total secondary is. In this case, the total secondary is 240 volts RMS. So the voltage between the neutral line and a live line will be 120 volts. Now, to further explain this, we'll go to the board and I can show you some diagrams. All right, so here we are at the bench talking about split phase power. So we have our power transformer, the 10 to one ratio. It has a 2.4 kilovolt input and a 240 volt output. It also has the center tap where there is a voltage potential of 120 volts between line one and neutral. And there's 120 volts between line two and neutral. Now, if you were to connect an oscilloscope to line one and line two, attaching the grounding straps for each, each probe to neutral, you'd see a waveform that looks like this. You've probably seen this before, two sine waves 180 degrees out of phase. This is what makes people think that it's two phases and not a single phase. Now, most oscilloscopes have the ability to sum together what it sees from each channel. If you were to sum these two together and they were actually two phases, 180 degrees out of phase, you'd see this, zero volts, because at each point it would be counteracting itself. What did you actually see a larger waveform at 240 volts. How can this be? Well, it's because of the way that the oscilloscope probes are attached. If you think of this as two different uh, transformers wired in series, or instead of one single coil, which is with just a center tap, you'll understand that you should be wiring up your probes like this. Probe one on line one, with its grounding strap on neutral, probe two on neutral with its grounding strap on line two. When you do it this way, you get this waveform, two sine waves overlapping each other. And when you sum it, you get the expected answer. The sum of the two, 240 volts. Now, I've made up a quick little example. I don't have an oscilloscope, but I can do this with DC uh, AA batteries. So I got, uh, Got, my multi got two multimeters here. We will set them to DC. All right, so here are two AA batteries attached to each other. These are unused, so they're sitting at 1.6 volts with a total of 3.2 volts. Under load, it would be 1.5 volt each with three volts total. So if we wire this up, well, let's just check that first, actually. 3.2 volts, perfect. And then 1.6 volts, great. So if we wire it up, the two meters, like we have, like you would with an oscilloscope measuring Uh, probe one on line one, probe two on line two. With the center, here's our here's our neutral in the middle. We get. I'll move this over. Plus one point six volts, and negative one point six volts. So shouldn't they cancel each other out? I think so, but no. What we really should be doing is. Wiring it up like so. Look at that. Oops, sorry. 1.6 volt. This is a shoddy example, but you can see each one has 1.6 volts. And that's why. That's why you see this common misunderstanding of the split phase system. They'll show you this when they should be showing you this, and it's all just based on reference points from where they're measuring with their tool that shows the waveform. And that's it for split phase. Let's go on to the next one.
The next three fundamental parts are going to be pretty quick. First, power level adjustment. Unlike in DC power or AC square wave, since our AC is a sine wave, when you adjust the amplitude, the voltage, or if you change the phase angle at which the sine wave starts, which is a form of power control I'll get into in the next video, there will not be a linear change in power level. So by changing the voltage by 50%, you're not necessarily lowering the power by 50%. Going from 240 volts to 120 volts, you will not see the power drop from just 2000 watts to 1000 watts. It'll be something closer to 750 watts. For power usage, there are essentially two main sections in the circuit that will be using power. You have your control circuitry and then the load. In terms of power usage, control circuitry is going to be largely inconsequential compared to the load itself. The load will typically be what we call a resistive load since it's effectively just a piece of wire designed to get really hot. The resistance of the load doesn't change for all intents and purposes, so the amount of current flowing into it depends on the voltage, meaning the value of resistance is a key factor to know since it will let you determine the amount of power and current being used. Finally, there are really two basic electricity related formulas you need to know. They are Ohm's law, V equals I times R, and power law, P equals V times I. You can then rearrange these and substitute one into the other to determine what other values you need. All right, so three main questions. How much power can I provide? How much power do I need? And how do I control that power? First thing you, what you need to do is to go look in your electrical panel and see what circuits are available and what the breakers or fuses are rated for on that circuit. I myself use a dryer circuit. It has a 30 amp dual pole breaker, so it provides 240 volts and 30 amps, which is around 7,200 watts of power total. So right away, I know that I can't have total power usage higher than that. If you're using a pre-made device that you can just plug in, then you don't really need to go any further in this video unless you want to learn some things. Before I get into how to calculate how much power you need, I'm going to suggest that anyone who's going to be using electricity to use, to include a ground fault interrupter uh, breaker in their circuit. So somewhere between the socket that you plug into and whatever you're using to control. That way if there's a leakage current between uh, a live wire and ground, this will detect that and it will shut the circuit off so you don't risk electrocuting yourself. These are typically wired up anywhere you will have a liquid near an electrical source, like in your bathroom or in the kitchen. So now we need to figure out how much power I need, or how much power you need. It takes roughly 4.184 kilojoules of energy to heat one liter of water by one degree Celsius. This is called its specific heat capacity. So let's say you're using a typical keg still. There's 50 liters of liquid in it, or 50 liters of water, we'll say, at 20 degrees Celsius, and you want to heat it up to 100 degrees Celsius. That would take 4.184 kilojoules times 50 liters times 80 degrees Celsius, since the difference between 20 and 100 is 80, that would equal 16,736 kilojoules. The next thing we need to do is turn that energy requirement into a more relatable value. One joule is equal to one watt second, so one kilojoule is equal to one kilowatt second. And since there are 3,600 seconds in an hour, you can say 3,600 kilojoules is equal to one kilowatt hour. It's a common uh, unit used by electric companies to find out how much energy you're using. So if we divide that original 16,736 kilojoules by 3,600, we get the amount of kilowatt hours required. In this case, it's 4.65 kilowatt hours. So a 4.65 kilowatt heating element running for one hour would use up that amount of energy and would ideally heat up our 50, liter, 50 liters of water from 20 degrees Celsius to 100 degrees Celsius. Realistically, there will be both 
time losses and time gain. It might take a bit more due to heat radiating out from the, the vessel that we're still holding the water in from the keg, uh, but it will also take less time and less energy because a regular wash has ethanol in it between 5% and 40%, and ethanol has a lower specific heat capacity, meaning it might take less time. So if you want the water or the liquid to heat up to a temperature in one hour, you would need a 4.65 kilowatt heating element. That's an odd number for a heating element. They typically go up in 500 watt values when you get up into the higher ones. You can get 4.5 kilowatts, 5 kilowatts, 5.5 kilowatts, 6. Those higher values would lessen the amount of time and also make up for the realistic heat losses you'll get through the walls of the vessel. And as a side tip, I really recommend insulating everything you can. It really does make a rather profound difference. You can buy uh, metalized bubble wrap, sometimes it's called Reflectix. You can wrap that around the, uh, the still itself. You can wrap it around your column if you want your column to heat up quicker and stabilize quicker. And you can even wrap it around your condenser so that heat, ambient heat from the environment doesn't also try to heat up that water. And all, the only thing that's heating it up is the vapor inside the condenser. Lastly, how do I control that power? Well, there are really two main ways. Phase angle control, also called phase fired control, is the main method used to control the amount of power going to the element. Using a device typically referred to as a solid state voltage regulator, also known as an SSVR, or erroneously an SSR, which is a solid state relay, an on off device, or an SCR, which is a discrete component, a silicon rectified, sorry, silicon controlled rectifier. The other main way to control is by using a PID device, proportional integral derivative device, used to control heating to a specific temperature. I'll talk more on those two devices in my next video. And that is it for uh, this video on AC power. I hope you enjoyed it. Please click like and subscribe if you want to see more and have a great week.